Shalom, this is Chris. Let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Acts 26, we're coming down to the wire. This will be Paul before King Agrippa. Father, we ask you to bless our study and have us be like the Bereans, who receive the word with all eagerness, but examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And by this teaching, please enable each of us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And Paul's going to touch on being a doer and not just a hearer later in this chapter. Chapter 26, verse 1. Now Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul extended his hand and proceeded to make his defense. So again, this is Agrippa II, the son of Agrippa I, who murdered James and imprisoned Paul. We read about that back in Acts chapter 12. Um, Antipas and Herod Philip of Jesus' ministry were his great uncles, and Herod the Great, who was around when Jesus was born, was uh, Agrippa II's great-grandfather. So a little bit of a lineage here. A royalty, but uh, some debauchery also. Some commentators believe that Paul is snubbing Bernice or Bernike by not addressing her. He addresses only uh, Agrippa in, in this uh, opening. This does seem unlikely, though. The, the protocol excluded women from official proceedings, so Paul most likely meant no disrespect. He'll say later in verse 29 of, of this chapter, I wish to God that uh, not only you, but all who hear me would become a, a believer except for these chains. So the all who hear him would definitely include Bernice. Extending his hand here shows his audience that he was well-educated and trained in classical oratory and rhetoric. It's just something they did uh, to kind of open their speech. And this is a reminder that hit me that except for rare passages like this one, we're just reading words on a page. We don't have the benefit of body language when we read the scripture. And so I think that needs to temper our reactions a little bit because we don't hear things like tone of voice or body language. And so it's really difficult to say uh, with any certainty, uh, like some commentators say, oh, that response is sarcastic or means something other than what the words written on a page mean. We just don't know. So we just need to be careful with that. As usual, in all his defenses, Paul is actually on offense. And this speech is actually among the longest and most polished that uh, of Paul's speeches that we have recorded in Acts. Matthew 10 says, when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. It is not you who are speaking, but it is the Spirit of the Father who is speaking to you. Now, this verse is often applied to witnessing, and it may be true that that, you know, if we're nervous about talking to someone and sharing that the Spirit may help us. But we just need to realize that's not the direct context of this passage. This passage is directly when you're called to give an account uh, by some authority. And for Paul specifically, we have Acts 9, 15. The Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and sons of Israel. So remember when uh, Ananias of Damascus was a little bit nervous about welcoming Paul in, uh, the, the, this, this, you know, the Lord gave him assurance that he's on my side now. I've, I've, uh, I've had a little meeting with him and we have an understanding. This is the fifth of six defenses recorded in Acts. The last one will be in Acts 28. Uh, as we've talked about, we believe there was a seventh one in front of Nero in which Paul was actually acquitted of these charges. So we're coming to the end here, but um, there's actually no no one here to accuse Paul. So this is not really a, a, a legal defense. Paul's main purpose here is to share his testimony. And he's, his goal is to um, convert Agrippa and anyone else present to follow Jesus as their as their Messiah. And so what follows here is considered Paul's greatest speech anywhere in Scripture. So it's a take time to read it uh, just straight through and soak it in. One last note here. When he stretches out his hand to make his defense, verse 29 tells us that his hands were still in chains. Regarding all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So we have this consider myself fortunate that is probably similar to the word in Hebrew, ashrei, which means blessed or even happy. So Paul begins his trial before a king as a happy man. And so he's, he's, uh, he considers himself blessed that he has this opportunity. Paul's praise of Agrippa here is not 
just empty flattery. Politely, prob Paul, probably Paul is asking Agrippa to maintain the high standards that should accompany one who is an expert in such things. So he's, again, like he did before, uh, he's putting Paul on notice that we need to be fair and, and, and be, re be reasonable here. Knowing the truth, though, and living the truth can be two different things. So he's got both motives going on with King Agrippa. He wants to uh, uh, spur him on to true repentance and conviction as well as have a fair hearing here. When he says, I am accused by the Jews, we, we talk about this periodically, but it's just good to remember. Is he talking about all Jews everywhere? Well, probably not. Uh, the word eudaioi in Greek could mean all Jews. It could mean Judeans, those Jews that are in the region of Judea. But that's closer, but probably not even all Judeans were opposed to him. This is using a general term for the specific. So likely he's referring only to those handful of Jews in Jerusalem who accuse me. And we see this in our media all the time. We just may not think about it. Uh, if you get a media report that says the Americans ordered an airstrike, really there's only one American that can uh, order an, any airstrike at any one time, and there's a handful of others that carry it out. So 300 million people could not order an airstrike. So we need to keep, keep things like that in mind when we see uh, in, in John's gospel particularly or anywhere else in Scripture where we see the Jews written uh, just as generically like this. So then all Jews know my way of life since my youth. Again, he's not talking about all Jews. He's talking about those who knew him when he was a, a child and, uh, and coming of age, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation in Jerusalem since they have not since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. So Paul is offering uh, uh, evidence that any one of his acquaintances could be called and uh, would you know, testify to his character. The Greek does use the past tense, or I lived as a Pharisee, but we remember Acts 23, verse 6, he says, I am a Pharisee. So basically he's saying as in that day, just like we would say, I, I was a good child or I was not a good child. We would say that in, in the past tense, anyone who knew him could testify that Paul was always and consistently a faithful Jew here. To the extent any form of past tense is intended here, um, he would have given up the strictest parts that he references here when he went into the Gentile nations. So that required him to fellowship with God-fearing Gentiles, those who follow the God of Israel but uh, didn't necessarily convert to Judaism. And this is something that the Torah did not forbid, but the code of the sect of the Pharisees absolutely did forbid. And so that's maybe where he broke with being a Pharisee, but that doesn't mean he broke with being a Jew. Lancaster writes, Paul did not hesitate to eat with God-fearing Gentiles, even when other Jewish believers did hesitate. Agrippa II here would have known the Pharisees' sect very well, though uh, literally by blood and as well as by party affiliation, he was not a Pharisee, but he was a Herodian. And they tended to align more with the Sadducees, but we're going to see here that uh, Agrippa is persuaded at the end, just to cut to the chase, uh, he does not believe the charges of the Sadducees um, that have any bearing against Paul. And now I'm standing trial, Paul continues, for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. For this hope, O king, I am being accused by Jews. So hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. He's referring to all of the messianic promises that start back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where you have the seed of the woman, um, and then going on through the, the Torah and the prophets, Isaiah 7, Daniel 7, Micah 5, all the way to the Old Testament have prophesied about the coming of a Messiah, and Paul is now saying these promises have been fulfilled by Jesus. He's saying he's on trial by Sadducees merely for holding doc, uh, doctrines that are common to many mainstream Jews, including Pharisees. So this is sort of a, a trap here that he's put in, and it's not fair at all. Uh, what I believe is no different than what thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of other people believe. The 12 tribes here were represented by a stone on the breastplate of the high priest. And so you see a representative of that uh, at, at a model that's in the south of Israel. There's a common thought that the 10 northern tribes were lost. And so you only have two, uh, uh, basically Judah and Levi, that are preserved, but the other 10 are lost. Um, it's actually not true. Faithful representatives from the northern tribes migrated south during the, the northern kingdom apostasy and the resulted conquest by Assyria. So they, they got out of Dodge and they headed towards Jerusalem. We know this by the birth narrative in Luke. There was a prophetess, Anna, of the tribe of Asher. 
And so Asher would be one of those 12, 10 lost tribes. But according to Luke, uh, Asher knew exactly, uh, Fanuel, sorry, Anna knew exactly where she was and she was of the tribe of Asher. Now it's true that after the destruction of the temple, uh, most believe that almost all genealogical records would have been lost and therefore full-blooded Jews today would have practically no way of definitively identifying which of the 12 tribes they came from. So all that kind of stopped uh, at, at the uh, the close of the uh, destruction of the temple and, and that leads to you know, many evidence to the Messiah had to come before 70 AD. Uh, we do have modern surnames such as Cohen, Cohn, Khan, Levin, uh, all of those might suggest a descendant from the tribe of Levi. Cohen means priest in Hebrew, and of course, Levin is related to Levi. We don't know, but that's just a, you know, a speculation. Paul continues, Who, why is it considered incredible among you or among you people if God raises the dead? This is a picture of the, uh, the ceiling of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It's just a beautiful structure built over the traditional locations of the, the tomb and the resurrection, and it's called the edicule. It says a, a structure that's on the, on the bottom represents uh, what remains of the tomb here. You people sounds like it would be demeaning in English, but that's not at all how Paul meant it. Uh, the word people was actually not even in the original. Uh, all Paul is doing here is saying, he says you in the second person plural. So he turns from addressing Agrippa directly, and he speaks to all present. Um, the resurrection is the great hope of the Jewish people. And if it's acceptable to believe that God will raise the dead, then it should be acceptable to believe that at least Paul and his followers uh, would say that God raised Jesus of Nazareth. And even if the opposition didn't believe in Jesus, Paul's belief in the resurrection was mainstream Judaism. There's nothing wrong with it. Luke is likely editing for space here, and so writing in that day was very expensive. Paul probably went on for some time with his testimony, and Luke just kind of truncates that. And here he's transitioning from his early life into the phase of his life where he zealously persecuted the believers, and his goal was to get them to renounce their faith in Jesus. So fast forward to uh, to the resurrection and Pentecost, and we have Paul you know, at, at this time. So I thought to myself, I had to act in strong opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, I also cast my vote against them when they were being put to death. And as I, and as I punished them, often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. Since I was extremely enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And when he says blaspheme here, he means them to get to speak against their faith in Jesus. Um, basically, his position is he already viewed them as blasphemers against Israel's God. So that's not what he was trying to get them to blaspheme. Uh, he's basically trying to get them to repent back to uh, his way of thinking. Cast my vote leads to some speculation in the commentaries. Some believe that Paul was once a member of the Sanhedrin. It literally means to cast a stone, and that's how they voted in that day. Uh, but he could just be merely saying he agreed with their action. You know, I, I, I threw my lot in with, with them. And by sharing this, uh, Paul is, is telling Agrippa that he is the least likely of anyone to become a follower of Jesus. If the encounter he's about to share was not real, then how could one explain his abrupt change of mind, right? So he's, he's, he's laying out how bad he was uh, in, in setting up his, his, uh, his calling. In his letters, he's going to recount his former persecution of the believers a number of times. One of those is 1 Timothy 1. Even though I was previously a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now he's going to talk about his uh, Damascus Road experience. This will be the second account of this calling, his transformation, and the third account overall. So we had Acts 9 by Luke, and then previously in Acts 22, Paul well, told the story once before. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus, with the authority and the commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining all around me with those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The goad was a long stick, uh, like the one held by the man in this illustration, and it would be used to provide the livestock, usually an ox, 
to keep them moving forward during plowing. And it was, just, you know, agriculture society. And so this imagery uh, would have been well known uh, in Greek and Jewish literature of, of an ox and all the metaphors that, that the, the farmer plowing um, w- would use. Jesus makes an ox and goad reference at the end of Luke 9. And we just covered this on our Wednesday uh, gospel lesson. So I think it's always fascinating when the two lessons overlap Sunday and Wednesday. Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So the detail is startling here. He doesn't say one who puts his hands on the plow. It says put hand to the plow because there would be the goad in the other hand. And so if you look back, your your goad would be absolutely useless and your ox probably wouldn't go in a straight line. And so the what he's saying there is a disciple must be focused on his mission. Now here, he uses almost the same illustration, but he reverses it. Instead of talking about the farmer, he says Paul is like an ox offering up useless resistance. And, you know, the, the farmer is going to use the goad whether the ox likes it or not. So basically, uh, you know, kind of what are you doing here? Let's, let's be smart about this. Paul actually should have listened to his old teacher, Gamaliel, um, who we read in Acts 5. And so this is Gamaliel speaking to the council. I say to you, stay away from these men, meaning stay away from these believers. Leave them alone. For if the source of this plan or movement is men, it will be overthrown and it will come to nothing. But if the source is God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or you may else be even found fighting against God. And so Gamaliel's words here turned out to be prophetic. Uh, by kicking the goads, uh, Paul was fighting against God, uh, you know, figuratively and, and maybe literally too. Um, but get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen me, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. So this is very much sounding like a uh, an Old Testament style calling of a prophet. Um, whereas usually he just says he was told to get up here. He clarifies it was get up and stand on your feet. Just like in Ezekiel 2, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And this is commissioning Ezekiel. And in the same way, Paul is being commissioned by by, uh, the Lord here. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles whom I send to you. And we have this in Acts 22. Uh, He said to me, go, I'm sending you far away from the Gentiles. So again, he's, he's undeniably here recounting a prophetic calling that would fit right in with the Old Testament prophets. We looked at Ezekiel last time. How about Jeremiah? The Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. So commissioning as a sent one here. And all that I command you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. So does the Lord change his methods? You know, maybe a little bit, but overall, not really. When he calls someone, uh, he calls us all to be bold and do not fear. Do not fear those who will be against us because he who is with us uh, is much greater than those who are against us. Jesus is continuing talking to Paul here to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Unbelievers are in spiritual blindness and uh, spiritual darkness. So the Bible often uses these themes of light and eyesight as a picture of salvation, and blindness and darkness as a picture of being lost. Isaiah does this all the time. 42, 7, uh, chapter 61, verse 1, which Jesus read at the synagogue in Nazareth, open the eyes of the blind, set the captives free. And then also in Isaiah 35, verse 5, the eyes of those who are blind will be open, and the ears of those who are deaf will be unstopped. John uses this quite a bit in his gospel, particularly talking about the blindness of the leadership of, of that day. Paul continues this imagery in his writings. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So this thought of going from darkness to light, and we all want to walk in the light as he is in the light. And that's from 1 John. Paul talks about here two themes that we tend to separate, but they really go together. Forgiveness of sins 
and an inheritance of those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Too often the church focuses only on the former. We, we, we love forgiveness of sins, but if you're going to have an inheritance, um, that, you know, that may mean some obligations here because Paul writes in Romans 8, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We love that part, right? Everyone wants to be a joint heir with Jesus. But then Paul continues, if indeed we suffer with him. Oh, I don't know if I like that part of it. Uh, can I just focus on being a fellow heir? Paul says there's a condition uh, of, of being a, a fellow heir with Christ is that you have to suffer with him. An unwillingness to suffer with him might suggest a lack of being sanctified by faith in him, going back to Acts 26. So tying it all together. Um, if, if you're not willing to suffer, you know, you, you might want to check whether there is a saving faith involved. And this is not for any listeners of this, but if you're sharing with people who are kind of bucking at, uh, at the, the work into being a disciple and the suffering part of it, people who want to be comfortable, you need to kind of share this with them and, and try to be, <laughs> uh, to be the one who's, who's trying to bring them from darkness into light. Those who oppose God, it also talks about the power of Satan. We need to remember that those who oppose God are influenced by the evil one. This is not a lifestyle choice or intellectual decision. This is a spiritual battle, and we need to tap into the, our spiritual power, who is, again, greater than Satan, and you know, have some patience and compassion with those who are lost. For that reason, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. That's that's an, the understatement of the year. Paul was all in all the time. But continually proclaimed to those in Damascus first and in Jerusalem and all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they are to repent and turn to God, performing deeds consistent with repentance. Again, see this theme of repenting means you're going to have deeds consistent with repentance. Um, and that's what John the Baptist talked about. Jesus talked about it all the time. Uh, so Paul continues the theme that if repentance is genuine, it should be accompanied by a change in behavior. And so we need to reject this thinking that our works don't matter. They don't matter if we're trying to be saved by our works. But genuine repentance, as John MacArthur says, is inseparably linked to a changed lifestyle. There's got to be evidence. There's got to be fruit of, of a salvation and, and of that forgiveness. Paul cautioned against the works of the law as a component of conversion, as a requirement to become Jewish. But Paul was not at all a purveyor of cheap grace. Uh, deeds consistent with repentance have to go hand in hand. Now, Paul's going to continue, the Jewish leaders are actually not repentant. For these reasons, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to murder me. So Paul is saying he's being persecuted for following Jesus' command to spread the gospel. He was told what to do by God. He was doing it. Uh, he's just being faithful, and yet here he is in trouble. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to the small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, as to whether Christ was to suffer, and whether, as first from the resurrection of the dead, he would proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Verse 22 is Paul's core argument here. I am stating nothing except what the prophet and Moses said was going to take place. And we see this connection that he has with the prophets. Paul's teachings didn't contradict Torah. They didn't contradict Judaism. These, his teachings emerged from both of those, from the Torah and from Judaism. Isaiah 49, 6, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, there's the nation Israel, to restore the protected ones of Israel? I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So when the Jews of that day thought that Gentiles were beyond reaching, uh, they haven't read Isaiah very closely. Uh, Isaiah 2, the Torah will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is, is the center, and just like Acts 1-8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. So God's plan includes Jews as well as Gentiles. We need to remember that today. In Paul's day, they were surprised that his plan included Gentiles. Today, I think we're surprised that his plan includes Jews. And the the numbers and the reports of, of Messianic believers coming to faith, just, you know, they have to keep it quiet in some respects, but um, it's just continuing to grow. And there's lots, God is doing a major work among the Jewish people uh, coming to faith in, in Jesus, their Messiah. 
Paul here is presenting proof of several things, and he's laying them out in logical order here. Jesus suffered and died, first of all. He was the chief of the resurrection, so he rose from the dead himself. And the reason he did that was to bring light to those who are in spiritual darkness. Further, by the power of his resurrection, he's providing proof that his words are true and that the resurrection of all saints will happen too. So when Paul's preaching about, look, mainstream Judaism teaches the resurrection, uh, that is all part of what I'm teaching also. Further and very importantly, Paul is saying these teachings do not go beyond what was already spoken in the Hebrew Bible. So he mentions Moses and the prophets. Um, all, of, all of this has its foundation in the Old Testament. While Paul was stating these things in his defense, Festus, remember Festus isn't Jewish, he's, he's Roman, pagan, said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you insane. This is a picture of Dionysus, uh, who in Greek mythology was the god of ritual, madness, wine, ecstasy, and theater. So Festus may have had this god in mind when he accused Paul of being out of his mind. Um, you see a combination here, wild and bizarre images. Uh, it's thought to portray Dionysus as a child on a tiger holding a cup of wine, just kind of craziness. Uh, the Romans knew the same god by the name Bacchus. So this this kind of, we tend to think of that as frivolity, but there's also a sense of being out of touch with reality um, if you're following this god. Remember Festus, not a Jew, it was a pagan, and I, I believe, you know, most of the commentators say he was just astonished that anyone could possibly believe that the dead would live again. That's just crazy. Um, this interpretation is, is interesting, uh, given that Paul was discussing Jewish matters. So it's kind of like, this doesn't concern you. Uh, Festus had a right to interrupt, but the interruption is, is a little bit odd here. The emotion behind his response, though, possibly indicates maybe he was understanding more than he wanted to. And, you know, he was, he was putting up a defensive mechanism here. Festus may not know, but Agrippa should. So um, Paul continues, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I am speaking out with truthful and rational words for the king. So he turns back to Agrippa, knows about these matters, and I also speak to him with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner, has not been done silently. That Jesus rose from the dead, which some believed and others did not, was common knowledge among Jews in that region. So this was not a surprise to Festus. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And so Paul here is putting Agrippa in check, just like Jesus did. If you remember the time where he asked the chief priests and the Sadducees about John's baptism, this is in Luke 20. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And this is one of the uh, Jesus's checkmate moves here. They discussed among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say for men, all the people will stone us to death since they are convinced that John was a prophet. And so they answered, they did not know where it came from. If Agrippa had affirmed his belief in the prophets, then he would have had to admit that the prophets taught about the Messiah's death and resurrection. And so to affirm this would have made him look foolish in front of the Romans. To deny it, you know, would have been an outrage to the Jews and he would have been considered an apostate. So Paul probably really backed him into a corner, but Agrippa is, is very slick. He replied to Paul, in a short time, do, are you going to persuade me to make a Christian of myself? Some versions have it as a question. The NASB has it as a statement. In a short time, you are going to persuade, to persuade me to make a Christian of myself. And remember what I said earlier, we don't have the benefit of body language. We don't know his tone. Um, the ASV on this side has it, a slide has it as a question. Um, we don't know whether he was being scoffing or sarcastic. Perhaps Paul's logic was starting to hit home and perhaps a seed was planted. So, you know, we don't know. So let's be very cautious about assuming that Agrippa was being sarcastic. But in any case, like the Sadducees before Jesus in Luke 20, Agrippa doesn't answer the question, but really parries and uh, has an applied question of his own, if not a direct question. He uses the term Christian here, and this is interesting. He makes it clear, and he's not using it demeaningly uh, because Paul doesn't, doesn't correct him like that. Um, he makes it clear, though, he's familiar with the disciples of Jesus and their claims. And he knows that most of the proponents are not dangerous uh, anti-Jewish revolutionaries, just the opposite, in fact. In this context, by saying Christian, he meant messianic, really, uh, because the Greek word for Christ is the same as the Hebrew word for Messiah. It was only much later, maybe 75 or 100 years after this, that Christian came to mean a Gentile 
follower of a new religion outside Judaism. But here, a, a, a Christian could very easily have been a, a Jew. Paul said, I would wish to God that in even in a short or long time, not only you, but all who hear me this day would become such as I am, except for these chains. So Paul is not ashamed to tell governors and kings they need to receive the saving redemption of Jesus. And for a lot of reasons, uh, maybe uh, Agrippa was being uh, conflicted here. In any case, he had heard enough and he calls an end to the proceedings. The king stood up and the governor and Bernice and those who were with uh, sitting with them. And when he had gone out, they began talking to one another saying, this man is not doing anything deserving of death or imprisonment. So they adjourn the proceedings, then they meet privately with, with what their you know, deliberation is going to be. Both agreed that there's just no case here. Not only is Paul not guilty before Roman law, and that's the only law that really mattered here, but for good measure, Agrippa is saying Paul isn't even offensive to Agrippa's even more liberal brand of Judaism. He's, he's doing fine there too. Uh, Agrippa's opinion here would have definitely been included in Festus's documentation for this case being sent to Rome. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Just as Festus declared Paul innocent of breaking Roman law, Agrippa again declares him innocent of breaking Jewish law or the Torah law. And you have to wonder why a generation of Christian commentators come to the conclusion that Paul came to do away with Judaism. Because right here, Paul says he doesn't, and the, the king of, uh, of the region says he didn't. So, you know, kind of, oh, what's the truth here? I think, I think I'll stick with Paul's words rather than uh, the words of a commentator. The accused here deserved to be released with the court's deepest apologies. However, Paul had already set the appeal in motion, and some would say the matter was actually out of Festus's hands. Um, the, basically, the trial had ended, and uh, you know, proceedings were already in place to send Paul to Rome. This was just a courtesy hearing for King Agrippa. Keener, though, suggests it was in Festus's legal authority to set Paul free. But really, politically, he was none too happy to extract himself from a difficult political situation. So again, just like Pilate, just like Felix, uh, Festus knows the right thing to do, but doesn't do it. And so in chapter 27, we'll set sail again with Paul on his adventures on the way to Rome. And so join us next time for chapter 27 along the Talmudim Way. Mm -hmm.